Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our DCS 0 to 8 series. So in this series what I hope to do is uh, give you the opportunity to see DCS from the absolute basics and work our way all the way up to the uh, more advanced options of course. So the way I decided to structure this series is basically going to be almost like a three-parter. The first part is going to be basic flight and kind of introducing you to DCS world in general. The second half is going to be intermediate flight. It's actually going to be giving you the ability to you know experience a little bit of what it's going to be like flying inside of a jet, learning what makes jets different, um, learning how some of the navigation systems are different, getting an absolute basic primer on explosives. And then the third part of the series is actually going to be moving on to a much, much more advanced jet. In this case, we're going to be concentrating on the F-16. Now, some of you are probably saying, why don't we just jump right to the F-16? Now, the reason for that is because many people who are entering DCS for the first time have not necessarily experienced what it's like to have to deal with all the TMS and DMS and MFD and all those other kind of things, and would rather, you know, kind of concentrate on the flying, especially folks who are coming from a regular flight sim. The reason I'm breaking this down like this is to make this easier for you folks. Now, I've got some great news. Uh, the people over at DCS have set things up so that you can actually try each one of these aircraft for free for two weeks every six months. So for those of you who like to kind of follow along with everything we're doing here, you actually have everything set up in such a way that you'll have a two-week period and about two weeks of videos for each one of these sections so that you can experience it kind of together with me. Or of course, you can go back and watch the entire series later on. For those of you who are absolutely familiar with all this and think it's redundant, I'd say go start over on the advanced. Uh, for those folks who are new to DCS, but done tons of flying, maybe the intermediate is going to be better choice for you and those of you who are brand new to DCS and possibly even brand new to flying will be concentrating on operating this Yakolov here and again the series will be broken down in that sort of a way. So the first thing we're going to take a look at whenever you're dealing with DCS, and again, this is our intro, 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 I'm assuming you know nothing here, is the fact that DCS stands for Digital Combat Simulator. It is a dedicated military flight training, or not even training, a entertainment simulator, if you want to consider it. They have a wide variety of different aircraft, each one of which needs to be purchased independently. Now, when I say this, uh, people always freak out because they start looking at those prices and start to panic. Um, don't worry, like I said, there's a two-week trial period that you're welcome to try all these, and they do go on sale probably about four or five times a year. I don't think I've ever bought one of these aircraft completely not on sale. So when you're using this, so like I said, you're going to have to create yourself an account here. I'm not going to go through the creating an account process, and I'm not going to show you my profile page, only on account of the fact that you've got some sensitive serial numbers and things like that. Keep in mind, this is totally free. You set yourself your own account. Whatever account you create is going to be the account you're going to end up logging into DCS directly with. So it's something you do not want to lose. You definitely don't want to have a password other people can steal, because you can end up with quite a bit of value on there, depending on what airplanes you buy. Once you create an account, you're going to have a little profile page and on that profile page you're actually going to have this little option that's going to look like this you'll see a thing that says trial licenses and it'll actually give you the ability to click one of these buttons which will give you the option to actually try these out so that you can see what they look like inside the simulator once you've gotten yourself either bought one of these uh, modules or you click on the try button we head back over to dcs to actually do the installation process the installation process uh, could not be simpler. Basically, what you're going to do is when you first sign in, it's going to ask you to log in and everything like that. You simply come up to the top of the screen, click on modules. It'll have available, and you'll just be able to go ahead and click on the install button to go ahead and begin the installation process. What the DCS will then do is it'll actually sign itself out, grab the files it needs, and then sign you back into it. So now that you're ready to rock. Now, once you've got yourself a new module, of course, uh, there's a lot of things you can do with it. Some people run up and press the training buttons, which I highly recommend. It actually does a really, really, really good job of explaining the basics. And again, depending on what aircraft you're dealing with, it's going to dictate kind of what you're going to see. But what I usually do when I first get a module that's a brand new, uh, let's say our F-86 here, is I actually like to go up to options. Now inside of options, uh, this is going to look very, very intimidating the first time you run out and uh, start playing around with these. The good news is this stuff is relatively straightforward. There's also these great presets down at the bottom that you can kind of play around with and actually set yourself if you need to do so. A couple things that I tell everybody to watch out for as far as settings goes, anything with the word clutter or particles is going to slow things down. So you want to be very, very mindful of that. Same thing with civilian traffic. You can actually turn this way up and get like a pretty world. If you have a very, very, very powerful graphics car like I do, I crank things pretty high. Some things I crank down just because I think they look weird. Uh, for example, coming down here, a motion blur I find irritating. So I actually turn that down or even shut it off completely. But you can see I have a couple different options on here. Again, uh, tweak this to your heart's content. There are some great guides out there for experimenting with that. One thing you want to watch out for is the smoke density though. Turn that down a little bit. Swinging over to controls, uh, we're going to go into great detail with controls in a minute here. Controls are one of the most irritating yet amazing thing you can do inside of DCS. As you can see from the Act 52, we have this many categories for a training plane. If you want to cry a little bit, we can go up to something like an F-14 here. We'll do the Aureo. These are all options. I'll open it up real quick so you can see how many controls the guy in the backseat has. Let's go ahead and take a look. Oh yeah, that's a lot of buttons. Let's see how many uh, things the guy in the front seat has for buttons. 
Oh yeah, and remember, there's a front and a back seat in that particular airplane. So that can get very intimidating very quickly, but I say stick to it. It's not nearly as scary as it looks. And if you follow the series with the basic, intermediate, and then end, it'll make much more sense where the controls are coming from, the ones you're actually going to need. So don't panic with this, and you'll see what I mean later. Next is the gameplay options. There's a ton of options here that you can play with as far as what you're gonna be doing when you first head over to DCS. Two that I immediately tell you to shut off are gonna be these two switches. You can put this game in what I call easy mode. Honestly, it's not worth it. Don't bother with it. For those of you who have very, very limited controls or limited time, it's not a bad thing. You can actually use them pretty effectively, but they have their own set of buttons, which just complicates things. Radio Assist is great at the beginning. Basically what it's going to do is just kind of, kind of let you know uh, some little notes. Again, don't worry about this too much. Most people don't notice it. Tool tips is a lifesaver when learning a new airplane. Highly recommend you turn that on. Crash auto recovery, this is just one of those easy options. Uh, if you don't do this, if you crash, you die, the mission ends. Easy communication in the beginning, this is a pretty solid system. Towards the end, this gets a little nasty. I'm actually going to disable this. I recommend you do the same. It's a pretty good habit if you're using something like uh, Flaming Cliffs 3 as your basis. Padlock basically gives you the ability to actually see a target. So on, if you have a control setup like I do, where you don't have a track IR easy to use, you can actually use this to lock onto something, keep your eyeballs on it the entire time. Unlimited fuel, unlimited weapons. Highly recommend, even when you're first learning, shut these off. Don't leave these on. Uh, Immortal is pretty straightforward. Uh, for those first couple landings, I highly recommend that you set it to Immortal so you don't mangle your tail or something like that. I only leave this on when I'm learning a new aircraft, and generally you want to shut this off once you kind of get comfortable. Allied Flight Repair Report simply says, uh, hey, I'm attacking a plane. There's somebody over here. I'm moving to this position. You can disable this. It makes it a lot less easy, but some people really like it also. Visual Recon Mode is a neat mode where you can actually look out the window of the aircraft, right-click on something, and say, hey, I spotted something. It's great for multiplayer. It is nothing for you in other ones. Unrestricted Sat Nav simply says that if you're not a country that has GPS, you don't get it. This is not a big deal. You can leave this on or off. View options, this is very interesting. Consider this like the uh, global map sort of a thing. Most people are a fan of Fog of War. They consider that a decent balance between uh, being able to see everything and being able to see nothing. My aircraft is great for training if you're trying to learn where everything is. And again, this is going to teach you that situational awareness very quickly. Coming down here, you have a miniature HUD. I never use it. Uh, mirrors, um, if you can turn these on, if it's just you alone in single player and you have a powerful graphics card, otherwise this will be a laggy nightmare, especially if you're in VR. Hide control stick, this is a little redundant because most of the control sticks can be hidden already. F10 user marks are only really relevant if you are playing multiplayer, but they can be handy in single player too. Wake turbulence, this is real fun when you're doing aerial refueling. Coming up on this side, you have the ability to select what type of editor icons you have. You'll see why this is going to be important a little later on. You can set the native avionics language. I recommend picking the one that makes most sense to you. For me, English makes more sense than Russian. You know, I speak a little bit of Russian, but just enough to get myself into trouble. And that's about it. Uh, when it comes to units, you can select whether it's Imperial or Metric. Again, if you know where I come from, you'd understand why I pick Imperial. Uh, GFX, I recommend leaving this on simulation. You can put it to game if you're first getting started out, but generally, if you black out, it's much more fun. Uh, we have labels. Uh, generally, when you're first starting with labels, a lot of people like to pick full labels. It allows you to know everything about the guy you're looking at. This gives you an unrealistic amount of situational awareness. Symbol only is kind of a nice balance between the two, and there are actually some servers that will use this at short range. And of course, you have the option for no labels. Pick the one that makes most sense for you. When you're first starting, I really warn people away from full labels. It becomes a little too easy to get addicted to. It's much safer to go with symbol only, which is what I usually leave by default, unless, of course, I'm playing an actual mission. Popping over to miscellaneous, uh, we can have a couple different things in here we need as far as external views. Head uh, movement by G-forces in the cockpit. I shut this off because I find it a little bit too much, but uh, feel free to turn that on if you like that. Uh, coming down here, I usually leave this one off. Systems failures, um, you want to be careful here. This can uh, basically backfire on you depending on it. Snap view saving lets you save where you're looking, which is super helpful. Showing the body, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, scrolling down here, we have automatic login. Make sure that's turned on. If you don't want statistics collected off of you, you can uncheck that box. Up in the top right, this is actually very important. This allows you to dictate what type of coordinates you're using. The aircraft you fly will dictate what coordinate system you can use. The good news is we can change this quickly if we need to. I like lat long decimal, but you're going to find out later on that you're probably going to need MGRS depending on what's going on. View effect simply makes it so that your little head kind of shakes inside the airplane when you're looking externally. Um, some people love this. I find it kind of eh, too much. You can pick your theme here. Obviously, you can only pick the themes that you have. It works pretty well. Uh, we have the ability to let service take screenshots. We have the controls indicator. I usually disable this, but sometimes for helicopters, it helps a lot. And of course, we have BDA, which simply automatically dictates uh, how damaged something is. It's actually pretty helpful. 
audio. Uh, the only things I say watch out for here is with your main audio out. Keep in mind your headphones are going to be separate from your main audio out, especially if you're doing multiplayer. So make sure you set this the way that makes sense for you. Come down here, you have a fun little option that can make it sound like you're in the helmet. There's this G-breath effect. I recommend shutting that off. The loud cockpit afterburner sound just makes it really loud when you're an afterburner. I, I don't need this. Uh, radio speech is super helpful. And obviously subtitles is also super helpful when you're starting to get the hang of things. We have voice chat, which we can turn on and off. And of course, play audio and background simply makes it so that it mutes it when you're not there. So moving over, uh, we have the special options. This is basically airplane options. For example, if I wanted to come over to, let's see here, my Yakla 52, which is what we're going to be starting with here, you can give it some takeoff assistance, which I'm not going to lie. I feel like the takeoff assistance makes it harder, but these two are actually fairly useful to set. Once you decide what speed you're going to be traveling at all the time, it's actually recommended that you set this based on whatever you require. There is an auto rudder option for people who do not have rudders down on the floor. Highly, highly recommend this option. If you have a little twist grip, like on a lot of joysticks, it's going to be such a pain to try to keep this aircraft coordinated. So the auto rudder is your friend. And of course, you can go ahead and set the language too if you need to. For people uh, flying the C-101 and skipping right ahead, um, I do customized cockpit English. Uh, you can do the Spanish cockpit should you choose. It doesn't make that strong of a difference. For folks over in the F-16, uh, one thing I do recommend if you're, again, skipping all the way to advanced, set your canopy tent to uh, transparent, please. It'll make you crazy if you tint it, but again, do what works for you. Reflections, same thing. I make them none. MFD reflections makes it very difficult to see your screens. I set them to none. Afterburner detent, unless you have special hardware for it, don't bother with it. An HMD render eye. This is actually really, really neat because there's a helmet mounted display on here. If you're on VR, I actually recommend you set this to both eyes. It's going to make it much, much easier to see the helmet mounted display. So once everything's been all pre-programmed and you're happy with all the different settings and options that you've done, go ahead and mangle that OK button and then you're in really, really good shape. The last thing we're going to take a look at in our first little video here is how to set up a really basic mission so that you can kind of follow along some of the stuff we're going to be working on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the mission editor. And as soon as you do that, it's going to bring up a screen that looks like this. This lets you pick your theater over here on the left. Remember, you can try theaters out. This lets you set your coalitions, which for now I'm not going to bother, although there's cool little uh, presets that you can come up here. Usually for everything we're going to be doing for all of our exercises, we're going to pick the Caucasus, which is also the Georgian map here. I'm going to go and press the OK button. And as soon as you do that, you're going to be presented by this glorious little map. Basically, up on this side of things, you've got kind of uh, southern Russia. This side, you've got Georgia. And of course, you have Armenia. And uh, you have some little tiny bit of Turkey. But uh, we barely get into any of that as well. Now, what you're going to see when you first do this is, is a really, really wide collection of terrain. Now, you're probably saying, wow, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of here. Uh, can we simplify? Mm, no. But what you can do is you can convert to a map, which folks who uh, know flying from other simulators know this is a sectional chart. And you also have the ability, of course, to switch to an altitude view, which is very helpful because it allows you to see exactly what the terrain and all the major landmarks are going to be inside the map. Now, one of the great things is this is a hand-built map. This is not just generated. So there's a tremendous amount of detail in places you probably wouldn't expect it. For example, if I switch to map mode, you know, I can zoom in way, way, way down. And if I see that there's a particular object on the map, for example, this is the word tanks, I can actually switch over to satellite view and you can actually pick out those individual tanks that you're actually going to have there. So you're going to have a major, major benefit as far as uh, getting a high, high, high level of detail that you might not get in other simulators. That being said, there will be limitations on this map. For example, if I zoom out all the way, some of you are immediately saying, um, isn't there another country over here that we need to be thinking about? The answer is yes. They just chose not to build the details for that. Okay. So let's go ahead and show you how to get started here. So all of our flights that we're going to be concentrating on in the beginning, we're going to be concentrating up here in uh, southern Russia. The reason we're not doing Georgia here for most of our engagements is because this part of Russia is nice and flat, and it allows our own communication systems to work very, very, very well. So I'll go ahead and switch back to altitude view, which makes it a little bit easier to see what you're doing. And you can see we have ourselves uh, two nice little airports. We have Krasnodar Center, which is in the middle of town. We also have Krasnodar Pashkovsky, which is over here on the east side, right next to this old big old lake here. You're also going to notice there's a bunch of little dots down here that represents the different positions we're going to be needing as far as dialing and things for ADF that we're going to need quite a bit later on. Uh, when we're taking a look at other things, such as RSBN, now you can see that it has its own piece here. And there's also TACAN stations, but in order to access TACAN, you're actually going to have to come all the way down here to Sanaki. But uh, we'll deal with that a little bit later on when we get to it. So to create a super quick little mission here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and click on the aircraft button. And this is going to give us our default options. We can give it a creative name. We can go ahead and give it a country. And we can also pick what type of task it is. And we can also select the aircraft itself. So in this case, like I said, our initial aircraft, we're going to be concentrating on the Yak-52. If you're watching the Intermediate Series, uh, whenever you're creating one of these missions, you're always going to be creating a C-101CC, which is one of these right here. And of course, if you're doing the advanced ones, you're going to be concentrating on doing the F-16CM. 
If it is not highlighted in yellow, it means you have not installed it correctly yet, or you don't have access to it. You can always place something, but you can't necessarily control it unless it's got this little yellow kind of haze to it. So grab the aircraft, go ahead and click on the map, and as soon as you do that, it parks this thing in the air at a specific altitude. We don't want that. For initial food videos, we're gonna be starting mostly on the ground. So if I wanna change that, we can just come over here where it says turning point, click on it, and we can then select uh, anything. We can do ramp, which means we're gonna start from the ground in a ramp. You can actually zoom in all the way and you can see exactly what ramp you're dealing with. For example, if I wanted to do ramp 2-4 instead of this one that's parked over here, I can actually come over here, click on 2-4, and now I've stuck the aircraft into that ramp, which is gonna make it much simpler for us to whoop, whoop, and zip right over to runway 27, assuming the wind is coming from that direction. Now, after you've done that, you can click on the add button. You can actually go ahead and select where you wanna go. Keep in mind, different aircraft are gonna have different technology. So for example, let's, we want to go to Krimsk, and then we're going to go over to Novorysk, which is going to be right down this way. We can also come down here and define things like altitudes as well as our airspeeds. But keep in mind, um, we're the ones flying, so we're the ones who are actually going to determine what this is. Aircraft such as the F-16 that we'll see later, you absolutely have to set this up very precisely. For the C-101 and the Yak-52, we do not. But one thing I will do is when we get to this position, I'll go ahead and say landing, and it'll go ahead and change the color. We'll go ahead and say Krimsk is also going to be the color blue here, just you know, again, keep everybody nice and consistent. So after we've done that, if we want to make any other adjustments, so one thing I always like to do is I like to go ahead and edit the names of everything, just to make it a little bit simpler. You can take a nice little preview and see exactly what it looks like, in which case I got this kind of boring bare metal version here. Coming over here, you even have the ability to do things like define it as being uh, sitting all alone in the airplane. You can even define what kind of propeller that you're using as well. And again, depending on what flight you're doing, I'll walk through what your individual settings are going to need to look like so that you're going to have the ability to kind of pick them out and kind of get going. Also, we're going to be starting on the ground as well as in the air many, many times, but I will bring that up when we get to that particular video. Now that we've gotten everything all pre-set up and ready to rock, all we'd have to do here is come up to this, give the thing a name, press OK, and then we have the quick fly button where we can just boop, just like that. And if you've done everything perfect so far, you'll be sitting here looking at your glorious airplane. Now notice, I can't fly this airplane. What went wrong? Now that's a common mistake that people make. Whenever you place that aircraft there in the mission editor for the first time, you have to actually make sure it's enabled to be the player. So now that I've clicked that option, if we actually take a look bad at it, you'll notice I have a new radio button, which actually gives me the ability to preset radios. Now that's gonna be a complicated topic that we'll talk about another time. But basically in this particular aircraft, you're gonna be interested in only the ADF frequencies. In this case, we have a Trio Trio over here. And also coming up a little bit farther, we have a 625, which is gonna be right on this side. We'd simply dial those in. And as you can see, they've already been pre-dialed because this is the most common place for this particular aircraft to take off from. Now we fixed everything, we go ahead and jump inside. Press the start button. Take a look, and now you can see we are inside the airplane. By the way, I pressed the F2 key to get outside, press the F1 key to get inside. Pressing the number one key on the keyboard puts you in the front seat, pressing the number two puts you in the back seat. When we get to the F16, you don't have to worry about what seat you're sitting in. Now, when we get inside this aircraft, though, you will be interested in what seat you're in. All right, so that's kind of our big uh, video zero. Our next videos will be dealing with how to fly this little thing, kind of going through the basics of actually controlling it, setting up the individual controls, kind of managing the engine. Then we'll get to the intermediate videos where we'll take a look at the C-101 and actually get a little bit of experience with a little bit of IFR flying, as well as, you know, the basics of how gun sight works and how to drop bombs. Then in the advanced series, you know, we'll be in an F-16 and you know what F-16s are capable of. Enjoy.